Let's talk about the fact that most of us have a lot more adult life ahead of us than we think we do. Maybe even we might have as much as half or two thirds of our life ahead of us. In fact, if you're actually age 45 and you think you're gonna live till age 100, you have My name is Chip Conley, and I'm thrilled to be with you on this journey in the course, Thriving in Midlife and Beyond. Let me tell you a little bit my, about my story first, so you can understand who I am, and as I guide you as your Sherpa on your journey into aging, um, what my journey has been. So I grew up uh, in Southern California, moved up to Northern California to go to college and graduate school, and a couple years out of graduate school, I started a boutique hotel company in the mid-1980s called Joie de Vivre. Um, Joie de Vivre became the second largest boutique hotelier in the US. Each of the hotels had its own name. We had 52 boutique hotels around California. I loved it until I hated it. <laughs> For 22 of my 24 years as the CEO of that company I founded, it was my calling. People would call me the, the boy wonder because I was a youngster who had started a, a boutique hotel company. But by my mid-40s, something wasn't working anymore. My batteries were running out. I didn't, I didn't have that sense of calling for what I was doing. In fact, I felt weighted down by it all. In fact, in my mid-40s, I was weighted down by it a lot. Uh, I started to realize, man, my relationship I'd been in for a long time wasn't working. I had a, uh, an African-American foster son who was going to prison wrongfully, and I was trying to fight that good fight. Um, I was running out of money running my company in the Great Recession. My, my body was breaking down. Everything that could go wrong was going wrong. And from there, I realized, man, I don't want to be doing this anymore. But I didn't know how to get out of the trap of what is called the midlife crisis. When, when the life I was living was not the life I aspired to. Well, I had an NDE. I had a near-death experience based upon an allergic reaction to an antibiotic I was on after having a broken ankle and a, uh, a septic leg. And it was that NDE that was the wake-up call for the hotelier <laughs> who said, okay, I don't want to do this anymore. I've been doing it for 22 years. I did it at the, on the front end for creativity and freedom. And now with 3,500 employees in a downturn, I don't feel that anymore. I'd also lost one of my best friends. His name is Chip, Chip Hankins. And he was you know, my insurance agent, but also sort of sometimes my spiritual guide. Um, and he, he took his own life. He's one of five friends of mine in midlife, all men, age 42 to 52, who took their lives between uh, 2008 and 2010. My ND said, I'm gonna, no matter what, I'm gonna get out of this. I sold my company uh, at the bottom of the market. And next thing I knew, I was called up by Brian Chesky, uh, one of the co-founders and CEOs, uh, and the CEO of Airbnb, to be his in-house mentor. This was 10 years ago at a time when nobody had ever heard of Airbnb. It was a tiny little tech company in San Francisco. And I was somebody who had some hospitality and travel industry background as an entrepreneur. So I spent seven and a half years. And if, if my era from 45 to 49 was the bad side of mid, midlife, my era from 52 to 59 was the good side of midlife. I felt relevant. I felt like Wow, I would, they needed me there at Airbnb. And I realized that I had a lot to offer. So it was around that time when I was at Airbnb uh, that I went out uh, with my dad to go scuba diving one day. Um, we were scuba diving and before we went out for the morning scuba dive, I went to one of those online websites. I was sort of curious about my own aging because frankly at Airbnb, I was twice the age of the average employee there. So I went to one of those online websites and I asked myself, okay, uh, what age am I gonna live till? And you put in all of your data inputs and then they tell you how long you think they think you're gonna live. So I did that and it came back and said, I'm gonna live till age 98. I was like, wow, I had never really thought. I was at the time I was 57 years old. And I was thinking, okay, at 57, I'm gonna live till 98. That sounds pretty good. I went down to scuba dive with my dad. Now my dad, just a, a quick note on him, he was born um, in 1937. Uh, he's still living now, he's 85 years old, but he didn't actually learn how to scuba dive until he was 60 years old. And between age 60 and 80, when I was going for the scuba dive with my dad, my dad did 2,700 scuba dives. 
So he was a, a scuba dive instructor. He would go and do scuba diving in an aquarium in Long Beach, California. Um, so my dad taught me that, yeah, you can learn something new in your 60s. So here we are, my dad and I going out for a scuba dive for the day. And I said to my dad, Dad, how long are you going to live? I didn't tell him that I had done this, this little uh, online longevity test. And he said, Chip, I think I'm going to live till I'm 98. And I said, Dad, that's so funny. I just actually found out that I'm going to live till I'm 98. And then my dad, who's a bit of a mathematician, came back and said immediately, huh, Chip, if I live till 98 and I'm 80 years old now, if I start counting at age 18, I am barely into the fourth quarter of my life, my adult life. And then I started doing the math. I was like, wow, if I am 57 now and I'm going to live till 98 and I'm counting my adulthood from 18 to 98, at age 57, I was not even halfway through my adult life. Wow, that's a new form of math. <laughs> it's the kind of new math that we need to be teaching people all over. And to thrive in midlife and beyond, it has a lot to do with learning how to change our relationship with aging. To actually feel the sense that aging is not necessarily like something that you're a victim to, but it's actually something that has an upside to it as well. So in this session, we're going to talk about the upside and downsides of aging in a world full of anti-aging creams and products. You know, it's interesting that aging is a topic that it's sort of like the last socially acceptable uh, bias that you can have towards somebody demographically. I mean, we don't have anti-gay creams. We don't have anti-black uh, anti creams. We have anti-aging creams, though. Anti-aging creams basically speak to the idea that uh, an older demographic is not very well appreciated or loved in this, in this modern world that we live in. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the fact that most of us have a lot more adult life ahead of us than we think we do. Maybe even we might have as much as half or two-thirds of our life ahead of us. In fact, if you're actually age 45 and you think you're going to live till age 100, you have two-thirds of your adult life still ahead of you. So we vastly underestimate how much life we have ahead of us. Now, back in um, the, the 20th century, social scientists used to look at uh, life as three sets of 8,000 days. Um, the first 8,000 days would take you from when you were born tell you about your 21st birthday. And of course, that was sort of an era, right? I mean, you know, you're an adult now. These are your childhood and your adolescent years. And if you go to college, you may be graduating from college around your 21st birthday. So that's the first 8,000 days. The second 8,000 days uh, in the 20th century focused on the period from about age 21 till you're almost mid-40s, uh, 43, 44 years old. And it was in that second 8,000 days that you actually learned how to become an adult until you got to your midlife and you had what was coined in 1965, your midlife crisis. And so the second 8,000 days helped you to understand what it, me what it meant to be an adult. And then your third uh, 8,000 days would actually take you up till about retirement age, approximately age 65. Uh, so in the past, when we had shorter longevity, and again, we, ate, we grew longevity in the United States uh, in the 20th century from uh, 47 years old at the age in, in, in the year 1900 to 77 years old in the year 2000. So by you know, the mid 20th century, the average age when, of people, when people died was about 65. So these 8,000 days that take you to 21, that take you to midlife, and then take you to 65, that said basically you had 24,000 days in a lifetime. But today, we have been granted a fourth 8,000 days. That fourth 8,000 days takes us into our mid-80s. And the truth is, if you are a healthy person in your mid-60s uh, in the United States, you are likely to live an additional 8,000 days, taking you up to your mid to later 80s. Now, longevity is an important thing, and, it, and the truth is the socioeconomic diversity around aging um, is very interesting. I mean, it can be incredibly different depending upon what socioeconomic uh, group you live in uh, in the United States. But let's also let, recognize that the U.S. is falling way behind on longevity. The, here's, here are four countries that actually have greater longevity than the United States today. Cuba, Croatia, Chile, and China. 
China has two more years of longevity on average than the US. So we gotta get this longevity thing right. We need to learn how to actually uh, embrace the idea of aging and the idea of longevity. Because frankly, in the pandemic, American men had a, more of a, than a 30% greater decline in longevity than women. So this is important for all of us. So the downside of, of aging is often the fact that we spend a lot of time in the United States pretty preoccupied with our bodies and our looks. The playing field of the body, which is really what we did in, in our first 8,000 days and our second 8,000 days, we actually focused on our looks, on how svelte we were, how good looking we were, how, how, how uh, little body fat we had. And it was, a, it was almost an obsession, partly because the United States has a bit of a cult of youth. Um, if you look at the advertising in the United States, it is very youth driven. Um, the problem with that, uh, from a societal perspective, is that if you believe the only playing field you're playing on in your whole life is the playing field of the body, that, became, that becomes a more and more difficult playing field as you get older. Because it doesn't mean that you can't actually be that yogi with your, your leg behind your head in your 90s, or you can't write, run a marathon in your 70s, or you can't be actually working out in the gym at any age. But what it means is it is harder to, to actually keep that six pack. <laughs> you know, the six pack becomes more expensive as you age, uh, meaning it takes more time. Henry David Thoreau famously said, the cost of something is measured by how much life you have to give for it. Well, the cost of keeping a six pack becomes greater as you age. Now that doesn't mean we shouldn't be investing in our wellness, we absolutely should. But if we believe that the only playing field that matters as we get older is our body, uh, we're gonna be depressed. The truth is there are other playing fields we can be playing on. One of them is the heart. And what we know is that actually emotional intelligence grows with age. Um, it is one of those qualities that actually IQ doesn't grow, but EQ does. Additionally, our spiritual intelligence, our ability to understand ourselves in the context of something bigger than ourselves, that sense of being part of a spirit or a, a, even a religion that actually feels like it gives us a sense of awe, that actually gets better with age. Uh, famously, Carl Jung, uh, Carl Jung and uh, Richard Rohr have both said that actually uh, the primary operating system for the first half of our life is our ego, and it is around midlife that the primary operating system becomes our soul. Actually, another thing, another playing field that we can play on as we get older is our mind. Now, this is one that can feel a little dicey because, of course, Alzheimer's and, and dementia is a concern as we get into our later years. And we know that starting in our 30s and 40s, we, we forget uh, the names of people a little bit more, you know, that, that the, you know, the capital of Paraguay slips from our mind. Um, but the truth is, yes, our, our, our memory, our short-term memory in particular, actually declines with age. But what gets better with age when it comes to our mind is our ability to synthesize. What Arthur Brooks in his well-known book, From Strength to Strength, calls crystallized intelligence. When we're young in life, we have fluid intelligence, which means we can, we're good at problem solving, we're fast, and we tend to make lots of mistakes, but we actually are fast and focused. As we get older, we have crystallized intelligence. That means we actually can synthesize things. We're able to understand holistically how things fit together. We're able to connect the dots. So our mind does get better in many ways as we age. So one of the key upsides of aging is to realize that we don't have to live uh, you know, based upon our, our lives based upon the premise that every, the only way we evaluate ourselves is based upon our body. There's a, a Yale researcher named Becca Levy, and she's been a big friend of our Modern Elder Academy program. Uh, she, Be Becca's work has shown the following, that when people move from a negative perspective on aging to a positive perspective on aging in their mindset, uh, they actually gain seven and a half years of additional life. Now this is phenomenal. Just shifting your mindset on aging gives you more additional life than if you actually quit smoking at age 50 or if you actually started exercising at age 50. That's remarkable because the fact is this requires just a mindset shift. Now, a mindset shift in a world in which ageism is prevalent, both external ageism societally and internal ageism, that isn't easy. But just knowing that you can make that shift 
is the first step toward actually seeing the upside of aging. Mary Catherine Bateson was the uh, daughter of Margaret Mead, the famous anthropologist, and the psychologist Gregory Bateson. She actually said that as we have additional longevity, it's not like we've just added two bedrooms to the back of a house, as if that additional longevity means we're older longer. No, what she says is that midlife has extended. In fact, sociologists today consider midlife lasting as long as 40 years, from 35 to 75. It's probably more of a stage than an age, though. And what she says is that it's not about adding two additional bedrooms to the backyard of just additional old life. But she says that what we need to do is create a new blueprint, a blueprint that actually shows a home with an atrium in the middle, what she calls the midlife atrium. Because what you get from an atrium is space and light and a time and, and opportunity to reflect. So this is your time for a midlife atrium. How do you make the time to actually reflect on how you can have a better relationship with aging? That's what we're going to focus on in this course. Let's focus on a practice now, uh, a practice that you could do for yourself that would allow you to better understand how much life you still have ahead of you. Just as I learned with my father when we were scuba diving that I actually had more than half of my adult life still ahead of me, maybe you do too. Maybe you have even two-thirds of your life ahead of you. If you. As I said earlier, if you're 45 years old and you think you're going to live till 100, you have 67% of your adult life still ahead of you. So let's do the math. How, can you, how do you do this? Start with the question of what's your current age? You know that. And then ask yourself, how long do you think you'll live? Now you can do what I did, which is to go to an online site and put in a bunch of inputs. You know, you just go to Google and say longevity quiz and you'll, you'll see a bunch of choices there. Um, and let's say that you learn that you are going to live till just 80. Let's make it even, let's be a little bit more cautious and we'll say you're only going to live till age 80 and you're 45 years old. Well, if you do the math on that, you take 80 and subtract out 18 because that's when you became an adult. 80 minus 18 is 62 years of adulthood. So if you're 45 years old now, you have 27 years of adulthood behind you. And if you're 45 and you're going to live till 80, you have 35 years of adulthood ahead of you. So 35 divided by 62 gives you just over 56% of your life ahead of you. So at, at age 45, you might have 56% of life ahead of you if you're going to live till uh, age 80, or 67% if you live till 100. Why is this math important? The moment you realize you have that much life ahead of you is the moment you start to ask yourself, what is something I could do with this additional life I didn't realize I had? This is why I learned how to start surfing at age 57 or 58, as well as learn Spanish. Uh, because one of the questions I asked myself is, what is it that I regret today that I wish I'd learned 10 years ago that I now know today? And if I took that out 10 years, what will I regret 10 years from now if I don't learn it today? It's when we are in that stage of curiosity and that beginner's mind about how can I learn something new that we are realizing we have a huge upside of aging. Is there a myth of a midlife crisis or is a midlife crisis a real thing? Well, that's what we're going to focus on in today's session. Let me tell you about my life when I thought I was having a crisis. I'll start by saying, you can have a crisis at any time in your life. There's something called the quarter life crisis when you're 25 and maybe there's an identity crisis at some point in your life. So um, let's explore midlife though. And I will tell you that I thought I was having a midlife crisis between age 45 and 49. Um, I was having what uh, Bruce Feiler has called, he's one of our MEA guest faculty members, he calls it a life quake. A life quake is when you're going through many transitions all at the same time. And I was going through the following. I had a, a long-term relationship ending. I had a company that was running out of cash. I didn't, be, I didn't want to be running that company anymore. I had a son going to prison wrongfully. I had, um, I had friends passing away from, by suicide. That was a lot. And uh, what I really had to do is try to make sense of it. And at the time, I called it my midlife crisis. 
But actually, I now see it more as a midlife chrysalis, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. So the thing that ultimately changed it all was when I had this NDE, this near-death experience. Let me just talk about that for a moment, because I, people always want to know, what was it like to have a near-death experience? Um, well, thank God it was near-death. It was not just a death experience. It wasn't a DE, it was an NDE. Um, so I, what had happened was I was on a, this antibiotic, I had a broken ankle and a septic leg from uh, a, I, there was a guy named Gavin Newsom, if you've probably heard of him. He was my first mentee uh, before he was the mayor of San Francisco and now the governor of California. I was at his bachelor party, I broke my ankle uh, playing baseball, um, cut, got, got a cut on my leg I wasn't aware of, got a septic leg, put on an antibiotic, wasn't strong enough, put on another one, and I should have just stayed at home, but I went out and gave a speech. At the end of my speech when I was signing books, I went blank, and I basically slumped in my chair. They put me on the floor. For five minutes, I was out, completely unconscious. Just as the paramedics showed up, I came conscious. They put me on a gurney, and that's my first of nine times I died. So flatline, no, no heart rate at all. The, the paddles come out to paddle my chest to bring me back to life. And over the course of the next 90 minutes, nine different times I lost a heart rate. Um, the thing I saw, and again, this is, this is, that's not the purpose of this workshop or this course, but the thing I saw, I just want to share with you, partly because um, and an NDE can be a, an opportunity to understand maybe a theme in your life. So I was this, and the reason I know this was what happened in my NDE is because I kept coming back from the other side, and the nurse who was there with me the whole time said, you're telling me the same story over and over again. <laughs> so what happened on the other side is I, I saw that, okay, um, I was like a bird in the middle of a loft, like a, an upstairs loft of a, a mountain chalet. And I was flapping my wings up there, I guess maybe like a little angel. Um, and there was a huge skylight. And the skylight had light coming in, beautiful sun coming in, flowing into this uh, really nice large living room. And there was a kaleidoscope, with colors on the wall. Um, and I was just taking it all in. And everything was moving very slowly. There was actually a, a viscous, heavy oil on the floor that smelled like frangipani-scented, tropical uh, scent. And it was going down a set of very beautiful wood stairs. Long story short is, the lesson I took from that is slowing down. I had created a hotel called the Vitali, and we had, um, we had slippers in that hotel. And one slipper said, slow, the other slipper said, down. Um, and I, had that ha I created that hotel, we, we as a company created that hotel uh, three years before my NDE. And I was, when I came to each time, I kept thinking of those slippers. So what I will say is this, is you don't have to have an NDE. You don't have to die in midlife to realize why you want to live. We're going to talk today a little bit about why, though, people do have a difficult time in the middle of their adult life. So social science research since that time has taught me a lot. Now, my low point there when I had my NDE was when I was 47 years old. Little did I know that, in fact, the U-curve of happiness research shows that the lowest point of adult satisfaction is between 45 and 50 and, on average, 47.2. <laughs> Your mileage may vary. This is the point at which people's level of life satisfaction is at its lowest point. So why is that? Well, we're going to come back to that in a moment. But what's so curious to me is that the, the social science on this, the U-curve of happiness, came out about five or six years after I had my NDE, my terrible experiences, at age 47. So uh, do know that you can have it earlier or later, but, uh, but on average across all cultures. And what's interesting is that this research shows across all cultures, the only culture that doesn't have the U-curve of happiness is Russia. And Russia, frankly, you get unhappier as you get older in life. But this, the research is fascinating because the part that I'm, I'm focused on right now is that 45 to 50 is the low point. But actually with each passing decade after that, you get happier and happier. And that's why it's a U-curve because from about age 22 to 45 or 47, there's a, re a reduction in your happiness. And then starting from 47 
all the way to the last two years before you die, you're getting happier with each passing decade. So we're going to focus on that a little bit. So let's talk about the transformational journey of life. You know, the, the way that society sort of looks at things is, oh, if you can survive your midlife crisis, all you have on the other side of that is disease, decrepitude, and death. You know, so who wants to look forward to that? You know, so I, I guess for me, I have come to realize that, that that societal narrative that somehow life gets worse after 50 is so at odds with this U-curve of happiness. And frankly, what we've seen at the Modern Elder Academy, our average age of people who come is 54. Uh, and what we see over and over and over again is that people struggle with their 40s and there's some kind of liberation that happens in their 50s. The way I like to look at it is to use the, the metaphor of the caterpillar to butterfly journey. What, what a lot of people don't know is within the cells of the caterpillar are the DNA that ultimately makes the, the butterfly. They're called imaginal disks. These imaginal disks exist in the caterpillar. The thing that a caterpillar does before it actually spins its chrysalis is it more rapidly eats. It just accumulates. It eats more and more and more, partly because it, know, it knows, I guess, that it's going to spin itself into a chrysalis and be there for weeks at a time um, until it actually comes out as a butterfly. So this is also true of humans. Humans have a tendency to accumulate. Um, the first half of our adult life is often accumulating knowledge, friends, people we date, you know, uh, children, stuff, responsibilities, obligations. All of that happens during that 20s, 30s, and 40s period. And there's a point at which, around midlife, that we actually realize that we don't want to accumulate anymore. We're ready to edit. We're ready to be more discerning about what we have in our life. So it's sort of like the, the caterpillar, chrysalis, butterfly journey. It is in this middle point in life that you actually start to go into a cocoon. And yes, it's dark and gooey in that cocoon, but that's where the transformation happens. So instead of a midlife crisis, I would suggest you might consider that if you're going through a low point in the middle of your life, it might be a midlife chrysalis. So why is it that people actually have a, a low point around age 45 to 50? Well, there are a few reasons. Let me give you, give you some of the top ones. This is a period of lots of spinning plates. <laughs> what I mean by that is this is the busiest time of your life. And this is part of the reason why it's about the era of our life where we start to say, man, I cannot do more of this. You know, I'm spin I'm, I've got the, the treadmill going faster and faster and faster, or I've got more and more spinning plates. Some of this is also known as the sandwich generation. Um, a person who often has aging parents who need to be taken care of and have children maybe still at home or kids who went off and then came back and are living at home in their 20s. So the sandwich generation speaks to this idea that, man, you're the sandwich. You've got a, you've got loaf, a, a piece of bread on either side and a rather thin life yourself. My friend Brené Brown um, uh, has a term for this period of life and she calls it the midlife unraveling. And the first time she mentioned that to me, I was like, well, I don't know many people who want to unravel. I mean, that sounds like psychologically something's going wrong. And she said, Chip, have you ever actually looked in the dictionary under the word ravel? What's the dictionary definition of ravel? A ravel is something that is so tightly wound, you can't get it unbound. Ooh, really? That is midlife. <laughs> Your midlife is so tightly wound. There's so much going on. It's so sculpted and curated that there's no space for you to have curiosity, spaciousness, or even the ability to even take a nap in the afternoon. So I agree with, with Brené. I think there is a midlife unraveling, and the midlife unraveling is often the success script. There's a success script that defined how you thought a successful life was supposed to be. And it is often around 45 to 50 when you start to say, that success script does not describe the life I want to live. Another reason that people actually hit a low point around 45 to 50 is because disappointment equals expectations minus reality. Let me say that again. Disappointment equals expectations minus reality. Disappointment is often the result of having either too high expectations or to too low reality. For many of us, we find in our mid-40s that that's the time where we said, you know, I'm not going to be president of the United States. 
I'm not going to have, my, my spouse is not my soulmate. Um, my work that I do, I loved for a while. I don't like it anymore. I don't have a million dollars in the bank or maybe not even $100,000 in the bank or maybe not even 10000 And you start to realize around your mid-40s, maybe all of these expectations, all of these beliefs of how your life was going to be may never actually live out into reality. And that's actually part of the reason the unraveling is necessary. It's part of the reason why you actually have to re-script yourself and say, hey, I can write my own screenplay and I can speak from my own screenplay because I no longer want to actually be reading from someone else's script. This is also an era of life when your body starts to fail you. I also like to think of it as you're, you're failing your body um, because actually as we get older, we better be a little bit more conscientious about what we put in our body, about how often we're exercising. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying we should be obsessive about this stuff, but I am saying that you will notice your body changing more quickly during this era. And if you're not tending to your body or investing in your body, it's more noticeable. And, and, and in a culture that is so obsessed with our bodies, that can be really painful. Uh, for women in particular, women, I think the, the issue for women uh, in midlife is often you know, they become invisible. They feel less seen. Uh, and all of the things that they used to count on uh, to actually impress, uh, you know, don't feel as good as they used to. And for men, actually, quite frankly, the failing that happens for men is often they feel less powerful, less relevant. So the fact is the myth of the midlife crisis is not that all these things aren't happening. They are happening you actually are having these kinds of things happen in this era. The myth is to think that it is abnormal. The myth is to think that somehow you're the only one who's not getting the game of life right. And because of that, you, need, you feel somehow alone in the world. This is unfortunately why we've seen a, an epidemic in midlife suicides. Um, we have 50 to 60% higher suicide rate for people between 45 and 65 today as compared to the year 2000. Part of the reason we created um, the world's first midlife wisdom school, the Modern Elder Academy, was to help to socially normalize some of these common experiences that happen in midlife. We've created some practices and some tools to help people navigate these normal transitions. We'll talk a little bit more in our next segment about how to understand a transition because so much of going through a transition is to understand the anatomy of a transition. But for now, we're going to focus on a practice, a practice that I love. This is one of my favorite practices um, of this whole course. Um, I wrote a, a blog post. I, I have a, a daily blog called Wisdom Well, um, and it's free, and anybody can, you know, can, can uh, get a little microdose of wisdom if you, if you subscribe to it. Uh, and I wrote a blog post, um, I think it was about a year ago, and it was, why am I getting happier as I get older? And what I started to really look at is that the societal narrative on aging was losing its grip, grip on me. I had this perspective that somehow uh, aging was a negative thing. Midlife crisis was this thing that you get through and then you just sort of limp to the finish line. And, and as you saw from our re most recent uh, session, you have a long time to go to your finish line. <laughs> You're going to be living a lot longer than you might think. So as I started to think about this more, I, I wrote a blog post making a list of my top 10 reasons that actually I'm happier at that time or now in my 60s, I'm 62 years old, but in my 50s I think is when I wrote the blog post. Um, I have, I, I, I really thought about this. I thought about like, what are those top 10 reasons? So I made this list of the top 10, but for the sake of today's course, I'm gonna actually just focus on my top five. And then your homework assignment is going to be to create your own top five. What are the things that get better with age? Why is it that actually you might have uh, some more happiness as you're getting older than when you were younger? So here's my top five list. And you're welcome to use any of my five, but I think you should come up with your own as well. Number one is, I feel like I have some growing wisdom in my life. And wisdom was not something I thought about when I was younger. We tended to focus on accumulating knowledge. You accumulate knowledge because if you get, accumulate knowledge, you get smarter and smarter. 
But we live in a world that is full of knowledge. You know, all of the knowledge is in your pocket through Google and your iPhone. Uh, what's really valuable in life today is wisdom. In fact, I think more than anything, um, wisdom is what's scarce in society. So what is wisdom? I define wisdom as metabolized experience that leads to distilled compassion. So let's unpack that for a moment. Metabolized experience means I've had some life experiences and I've learned from them. And as a result, I've gotten better at how I live my life. And I can actually share that wisdom with others. So yeah, that, that's, a, that's a valuable asset. To, you know, that's something you build over time if you're thoughtful enough to understand what you've learned along the way. The second part of this wisdom equation, uh, metabolized wisdom that leads to distilled compassion, speaks to the idea of being compassionate. If it is true that we actually move in our life from our ego to our soul, then it is possible that as we get older we become more compassionate. We're less obsessed with the, the ghetto of the ego and what's in it for us, and we're more focused on being compassionate toward, toward other people. The reason I call it distilled compassion is because you can actually customize it for the person directly in front of you. We can be universally compassionate, and I think the Dalai Lama is pretty good at that, but not all of us can do that. But to be able to understand what exactly this person standing in front of you could use right now in f the form of compassion for them is a way to distill down all of compassion into what would be perfectly suited in this moment. I believe that as we get older, that growing wisdom based upon a metabolized experience that leads to the distilled compassion is something that we can prize and appreciate. Secondly, I'm going to quote David Bowie who passed away a few years ago at a young age. And, but he said, aging is an extraordinary process whereby you become the person you always should have been. That's so interesting. So that you become the person you always should have been. Uh, why wait till you're getting close to death for that to happen? I think one of the things that's beautiful about midlife and later is we worry less about what other people think of us. Or as one of my friends says, we have a lot less fucks to give. Oh, I said that. <laughs> is that okay? Yes, it's okay. Um, what does that mean? It just means like, I don't give a fuck anymore what you think about me. Now, I'm not saying that we should be rude about it, but I am saying that when you get to a place where you're so comfortable in your own skin, just as it starts to sag, you actually are at the will of no one else but yourself. And that is a beautiful quality of getting older, is getting to a place where you just show up with who you are and you're pretty happy with it. Number three on my list of what gets better with age or why am I getting happier as I get older is I am much more emotionally moderate. What does that mean? Now moderate is not a particularly interesting word. I, I like being emotional but moderate makes it sound like I'm like boring. But actually, let me quote Viktor Frankl here, whose famous book, Man's Search for Meaning, was really the book that actually helped me get on the other side of my NDE. Um, he, he was a Jewish psychiatrist, psychologist, who got uh, put in a concentration camp uh, during World War II. Uh, and Man's Search for Meaning is probably the most famous book ever written on um, meaning. And I love the book, highly recommend it. One of the things he said is, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is your power to choose your response. And in your response lies your growth and your freedom. So I am less emotionally reactive. I am no longer the pinball in the pinball machine. Instead, I have learned how to, through mindfulness practices, through going on walks with my dog in nature, through being able to count to 10, through using breath as a way of moderating my emotions, I am much better today than I was 25 years ago in terms of how my emotions show up in my life. I'm more emotionally fluent to understand what's happening and I'm less at the will of the emotional reactivity. So that's something that gets better as we get older. Number four is as we get older, we become an alchemist, an intuitive alchemist. We know in this particular situation what's needed, curiosity or wisdom, introversion or extroversion, gravitas or levity. One of the beauties of getting older is you understand, you're more intuitive 
about what the room needs and what you need. Um, there's actually even a term for this. It's called environmental mastery. Sort of sounds like, you know, someone who's great at you know, taking care of the earth. But in fact, environmental mastery means the following in an occupational way and a psychological way. It means that you know exactly what kinds of soil you are going to flourish in. And it, it, it means that you know how to find the places that actually you want to repot yourself in. And that's an exceptionally important thing because actually if you know where you actually are going to flourish, you can do a better job of being that alchemist of knowing what is needed in this particular situation. So that's our fourth, uh, my fourth um, example of what gets better with age. And then I'll finish with this one. As we grow older, we grow whole. It's not just about growing old, it's about growing whole. What does that mean? It means we're less compartmentalized. I, I will tell you, I don't know too many people in their 50s, 60s, or 70s who say their life is compartmentalized. But I know a lot of people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s who feel that way. It means we're more integrated. We choose to create the environmental mastery of our lives and actually know what to edit from our lives such that we have created a world in which we say the same thing to no matter who's around us. We don't just talk one way to one group and another way to another group. That kind of growing whole, that sense of holistic lifestyle is so healthy for us and so beautiful. And it means that when someone meets us, they can feel our sense of presence. They can feel that somehow we are real and authentic. These are the qualities, the kinds of qualities that actually get better with age. Maybe you'll have a midlife crisis, maybe you won't. Just know that if you do, it's a chrysalis. It's a time when transformation will happen. And on the other side of that, you will be that butterfly with all of these beautiful qualities. Hey, thanks a lot for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then I think you'll love this one too.